Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 as we continue our studies in the Psalter. I won't say that this is the greatest psalm in the Psalter, but I will say it is one of the greatest psalms in the Psalter. I know when many of us think of our favorite psalm, Psalm 23 is a psalm that comes to mind when you think of Psalm 1 and 2, but I'm sure Psalm 19 is on the mind of some of you this morning as one of your favorite psalms that's found in this book of the Word of God. Uh, let us pray now and ask God to give us understanding and give us ears to hear the message of Scripture. Father, we shudder at the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ when he looked at some in his day and said that God had not given them ears to hear. Father, we realize that the opening of our hearts, the, the opening of our ears to the truth of Scripture, it is the work of the Spirit. And so we come to you in these moments and pray that you would help us to listen to your word with sobriety and with carefulness. I pray that you would help me to read it in a way that brings honor and glory to you. And I pray that there might be a clarity in my speech this morning as I seek to expound this passage of Scripture and as I seek to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, for being a relational God. I thank you for being a God who speaks through creation and speaks through your word. I help us to hear the message of Scripture this morning. We pray these things in our Savior's name and for his sake. Amen. Psalm 19 and verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice are not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors, declare me innocent from hidden faults? Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, the theme of Psalm 19, it is very simple and it is very clear. The God of the Bible speaks and he communicates. God reveals himself to mankind. Uh, the divisions of this psalm are also simple in my estimation. First of all, God speaks through creation. We see this in verses 1 through 6. Then we see that he speaks through his word or through the Bible. You see that in verses 7 through 11. And then finally, God speaks through his son. We will see this in verses 12 through 14, especially verse 14. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. 
I watch an online hunting program, imagine that, and it's called a Growing Deer TV. And the host of that show is a man by the name of Dr. Grant Woods. Well, Dr. Woods must be a Christian because he always, always closes his program with this line. He says this, I hope you will get a chance to get outside this week and enjoy creation. But beyond that, I pray that you will take time as you're in creation and listen to what the Creator is saying to you. That's the way he ends that program every single time. It sounds to me like Dr. Woods has read Psalm 19. Isn't this Psalm encouraging us to get outside and enjoy creation even on a cold day? Isn't it summoning us to look to the heavens and marvel at the glory of God? But more importantly, this Psalm is admonishing us to slow down and listen to what the creator of heaven and earth is saying to us. He is speaking to us in creation. He is speaking to us in the pages of scripture. And he is speaking to us in the redemptive work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis stated concerning Psalm 19 that it is the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. So God is speaking to us this morning and we need to slow down and we need to listen to his voice as he speaks to us in nature, in creation, as he speaks to us in his word, in the Bible, and as he speaks to us through the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So notice verses one through six, and let us see how God speaks through creation. Notice first of all in these verses, pay attention to the language the psalm uses. It is as if creation itself is animated. It is, if, it is as if creation is living and breathing with an announcement. Notice the heavens are personified here. The heavens declare, the sky proclaims, speech pours out, knowledge is revealed, and the announcement has to do with God's greatness, with his glory, with his worth, and with his majesty. God speaks through creation about his glory and his greatness. But notice secondly in these verses, God speaks through creation continuously. His voice never stops in the created order. Day unto day, night to night. 24-7, 365, since the beginning of history, God has been speaking. It is amazing. There has been no quiet second in human history. God speaks to the world continuously through general revelation. But notice thirdly in these verses, God speaks through creation universally. Uh, verses three through six contain some powerful imagery. The psalmist likens the sun to a bridegroom or to a strong athlete and as the sun rises and as it sets, every human being is touched by it in some powerful way. We either see the brightness of the sun, we even see the, the effects of the sun on a cloudy day as the, as the world is illumined around us. And we also experience its heat, and aren't we glad for that on this Sunday morning after the week that we have experienced. Um, God speaks through creation universally. We sense the influence of the sun and the beauty of the sun. They are inescapable. So God speaks or communicates to us through creation. He speaks continuously. He speaks universally. He speaks powerfully. This is again what the theologians call general revelation. No one 
No one, no human being will be able to stand up on the judgment day and say, God, I never heard your voice. Because the Bible is teaching that he speaks through nature. He speaks through creation. As we saw this a moment ago in Romans 1, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Now, I feel like we really need to camp out on this section of Scripture for a few moments this morning because we live in a busy world and we live busy lives and many times we do not stop like Dr. Grant Woods encourages us to stop and enjoy creation and listen to what the Creator is saying to us. I must ask you this morning, when is the last time you truly listened to him? You ever get up in the morning and just stop with a cup of coffee or whatever your favorite drink is in the morning and just simply enjoy the sunrise? When is the last time you took a walk in the park? I took Lynn on a walk in the park just the other day. She survived. Have you ever just studied the spider's web before. And the fascination of this little creature that can weave that web in such a beautiful and such a tremendous fashion. Uh, my father gave me many good gifts, but one of the best gifts he gave to me was a love for the outdoors. He had me outside from the time I could walk. And some of my greatest memories as an older gentleman now is thinking back concerning my dad and thinking about the times that we enjoyed in the field and on the streams and on the lake. Uh, this passage of scripture is telling us that God speaks through creation. But notice also this morning God speaks through his word or he speaks through the Bible. You see this in verses 7 and 11 and the teaching again here is so clear. First of all, God through his word speaks to the soul. Notice verse 7, the law of the Lord, it revives the soul. The precepts of the Lord, verse 8, they rejoice the heart. In other words, his word, if we allow it to, it penetrates to the core. It goes to the depths of our being as human beings. Notice secondly, God through his word speaks to the mind or it speaks to the intellect. I love verse 7. Because whenever I have a church member that comes to me and says, oh, I'm just kind of a simple individual. I don't have that good of a mind and I can't understand the word of God. I say, okay, Psalm 19, verse 7, the testimony of the Lord makes wise the simple. God specializes in going to individuals that may not be the sharpest knives in the drawer and putting them under the teaching of the Word of God and making them sharp and making them wise and working in their minds and working in, the heart, in their hearts. The commandment of the Lord, verse 8, it, it enlightens the eyes. Have you ever noticed, for those of you that love the Scripture and meditate upon the Scripture and study the Scripture, how it stretches you, how it expands your thinking, you're always discovering something in Scripture that makes you see how small you are and how great your God is. And you always find things there as you read it that you've never seen before, not because they weren't there, because you just missed them the first time around. And God uses His Word in such a beautiful way to instruct our minds, to instruct our hearts, to work on our intellect and to fashion us into the image of Christ. And then notice finally in verses 9 through 11, God through his word speaks to the will or to the conscience. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And verse 11, moreover by them is your servant warned in keeping them, there is great reward. 
And notice also in verse 10 this morning, God's message to us through Scripture, it is sweet speech. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Now, I believe that David is doing something for us here. He is placing great value on the voice of God, the speech of God through creation. But I believe in this second section that he is teaching us that the written word of God, it is superior when it comes to God's voice and his message to mankind. This is the drift or the argument in the psalm. The message in creation, it arouses and it impresses. But the message in scripture converts. It cleanses the heart. It cleanses the soul. It expands the mind so that we might see our sinfulness and our need for a savior. And it causes us, if we read it consistently, to go running to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Jesus Christ in John chapter 5 and verse 39 said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. The living Christ comes to us through the pages of scripture. I like Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, for the word of God, and you've seen this before if you've read it, it is living, it is active, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The value of the Word of God. I hear many people that talk about how they enjoy creation and sensing the presence of God in creation, but they never read the Bible. Uh, and we, according to this psalm, we should not do that. Creation should move us to Scripture, move us to the Word of God, move us to the point that we ask of God, do you have any greater message for me than the message in, in, in creation? And God responds, I've got this. Amen. Dig in. Read it. Explore it. Expand the mind. Renovate the soul by God's grace as you subject yourself to the teaching of the Word of the living God. Well, here's the question for the house today, or the challenge that I want to bring to you. If the Word of God is sweet, powerful, and wonderful, and perfect, and pure, and right, and all these things, why are some of us not reading it? You know, major denominations fought the battle for the Bible in the late 20th century, but now few people even take the pains to read the Bible. What is the worth of all those battles over the inerrancy and the authority of Scripture if we do not go past the battle for the Bible and begin to read the Bible? Some of the current stats that are available are not too pretty in this regard. I found one article by Al Mohler entitled The Scandal of Biblical Illiteracy. I think this article was written in 2015. And notice some of the statistics that Dr. Mohler brings out. Fewer than half of Americans can name the four Gospels. Many Christians can name only two or three of the 12 Apostles. 60% of Americans cannot name five of the Ten Commandments. And this is the one that makes me shake my head. 82% of Americans believe the saying, God helps those who help themselves is a Bible verse. 12% believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. 50% of graduating seniors think Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. And many responded to one poll saying that Billy Graham preached the Sermon on the Mount. By the way, I was at my mother-in-law's just uh, yesterday afternoon and watching TV, which is something rare for me to do. And uh, there was a documentary on, uh, and I don't recommend TBN, but it was on TBN, uh, a documentary on Billy Graham. Have any of you seen that yet? Uh, very well done. 
and, um, and, and a very good documentary about the life and ministry of Billy Graham. Folks, we got a problem on our hands. Again, J.I. Packer wrote a book entitled Beyond the Battle for the Bible. We need to go beyond fighting over it and we need to pick it up and we need to read it. We need to follow the counsel that Paul gave to Timothy in the midst of this terrible time of religious declension that Timothy was facing. Paul told Timothy, Timothy, here's what you are to do in such an environment. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God speaks through creation. God speaks to us through his word. We see that in verses 7 through 11. But finally, in the latter part of the psalm, we see that he speaks to us through his son, verses 12 through 14. Note if you would David's response to God's revelation in creation and in scripture. He begins to confess his sins, beginning in verse 12. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I believe we see here that David is, is humbled in regards to general revelation and special revelation. It has convicted him. He saw his frailty. He sensed his mortality. He felt the weight of his rebellion before God. And this moves David to close this psalm in the latter portion, uh, portion of verse 14 with this simple confession of his faith in the Lord as his rock and his redeemer. He senses his need for eternal stability. The Lord is his rock. And he senses his need for redemption and cleansing from sin. The Lord is his redeemer. Let us look at these descriptive titles just very briefly in closing because they are really great titles that highlight the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he is our rock. Sometimes we see that word rock in scripture and we say, well, why is it there so often? And why is it so important? Um, well, desert nomads understand the value of a large rock because they're out in the middle of nowhere with nothing but sand and the elements around them. And during storms, the rocks provided refuge from the wind and the sand. And then during the day, they offered protection from the burning rays of the sun. Christ is our rock. He is our refuge. He is our protection from the judgment to come. But he is also our redeemer. The word redeemer is a rich biblical word that speaks of the responsibility of the next of kin to rescue a close relative when that relative is in a helpless situation. And folks, we are in a helpless situation due to our sins. We cannot save ourselves. We need the work of another. We need a redeemer. We need someone to die in our place, and Christ has done just that. He has purchased us for himself. We are bought now with a price. David is saying in this closing confession, my hope for forgiveness and deliverance is not found in who I am or in what I have done. I'm looking outside of myself. My trust is in someone else for deliverance from my sin. Our good friend Spurgeon says this, he who is the wisest reads both the world book and the word book as two volumes of the same work and feels concerning them, my father wrote them both. Psalm 19, God's word to God's world. 
So let me encourage you this week. Get outside. Enjoy creation. And while you're out there, take your Bible and listen to what God is saying to us in the pages of Holy Scripture. Amen. Father, we thank you for the way you speak to creation. Uh, we know that we are without excuse as human beings if we do not listen to your voice in nature and to your voice in the written word of God. And all of this, Father, is a demonstration of your love and your kindness and your mercy to a fallen race. So, Father, I pray that you would make us individuals who know the Lord Jesus Christ and who love him, who trust in him for our soul's salvation, and then having come to him by faith, that we would become people who love his word, love his book, love his letter to us in the pages of Scripture. Thank you, Father, for this time and for the teaching of your word. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen.